first off, I think we can all recognize that trying to develop software is a really hard thing. Um, it's very hard to, to write, to redesign, and to understand um, how to develop software. And I think sometimes, as people who, who work on software, we feel like our clients don't really understand how difficult that can be at times. Um, and at the same time, we see that a lot of software projects, and in fact, uh, the majority of projects either don't deliver on time, they're not on budget, or they don't deliver what the client wants. So as a software industry, we have a real problem. Um, what we're doing isn't really working very well. Another challenge we sometimes face is, okay, we talk to um, our client and try to figure out what we need to do. And what we end up with is a nice laundry list of wishful things. And we tell the client, well, okay, well, what, what's most important to you? And they say, well, all of it. Just get, it, get all of it done by you know, such and such a date. So the problem is, the reality is, with most software, it follows the 80-20 rule. 20% of the software will get used 80% of the time. So the, the value in what we develop is only in a small piece, typically. So one of the things that we need to do is to try to figure out what is the stuff that's most valuable and stop doing less of the stuff that isn't so valuable. Um, so now we're into our project. We've got our project plan. We're ready to go forward. And what happens? Well, as we move along, we discover things change. Clients want different things, or we discover new things, or um, now we don't want to do what we were going to do before. How do you deal with that? Um, typically that's a real mess. You end up with all these change requests, which is more paperwork, which extends a project, or battles over budgets. Um, but that's reality. That's, that's what happens um, with projects. So we need a process that's going to be able to allow us to adapt to change uh, more easily than trying to adjust an MS project document. Um, there's a quote that I like, um, which I read in, in one of the books on Scrum, which says basically to, to do the planning and then throw away the plan. In other words, don't be married to what you started with, um, but, but do the planning because it's an ongoing thing. And then we might get lucky. We might actually you know, build something that's on time, it's on budget, um, fairly bug free. Um, but we get to the developer, or to the users, and we find, well, actually, it's not really what they wanted after all. So what happened there? Maybe, maybe we didn't quite understand what they were trying to, to tell us, or um, maybe they didn't quite know. And once they saw what they asked for, they realized, no, that's not what I wanted. So how do we deal with that? Uh, a number of years ago, a number of prominent people in the software industry got together and said, you know, we have to find a better way to develop software, and what I like to call a more humane way to develop software. And so they came together and they came up with this, this really amazing document called the Agile Manifesto, which is really um, a set of values in how we develop software. And so on the right, you see things that should be valued, but comparison to the left, we value the things on the left more. So we value inter individuals and interactions over processes and tools. We value working software over a whole whack of documentation. Right? Let's build something rather than talk about building it. Um, let's value customer collaboration over contract negotiation. Working to build trust, so we're not going back to a legal document to try and force one thing or another. Uh, responding to change over following a plan. Again, that ability to adjust and to adapt. And then there's a fifth one which is now in discussion, so I wanted to include it because I think it's a good one, which is craftsmanship over execution. In other words, more than just getting the code written and, and done, doing it in, in a way that actually is maintainable um, and extensible, not just uh, a bunch of crappy code. By the way, if anyone has any questions at any point, like there's a lot of information here that I'm just kind of quickly going over because I want to leave a lot of time for, for questions. But if anyone has a question at any point, uh, please.
please raise your hand. And uh, being Halloween and all, I thought I would offer some, some treats to those who are courageous enough to, uh, to offer a question. So, of course, for those of you at the very back, uh, the farther I throw, the wilder I get. So I won't guarantee that it might reach you. One quick question. Jerry, earlier you had mentioned that this is a more humane way to develop the project. Why did you say that? Well, I say humane because um, I think for a lot of people, what we do isn't a lot of fun. Um, we're overstressed, we're overworked. Um, clients aren't happy. We're, we're dealing with, with tight timelines. Um, and oftentimes, we're put in a situation where a customer and, and vendor um, are at odds with each other, right? Um, in order to meet a deadline and a, and a budget, now we're having to um, haggle over what's in, what's out, or um, we're having to, you know, cut down on quality in order to get it in. Well, that's that's not a good way to, to build software. Let's do it in a way that actually um, creates valuable relationships, creates a trust relationship between our clients and, and vendors. Um, let's do it in a way that um, teams actually enjoy building what they're building. So hopefully some of that will rub off in, in what I'm talking about. Here's a give him a treat. That's that's not bad for me. See I'm more of a frisbee player than a ball player. <laughs> so within this notion of agile software development is, is a framework that I use called Scrum. It's, it's probably the most popular one within the Agile world. And it's just a, it's a framework, a way of taking those common sense things, which is really what the Agile Manifesto is. I think we could all agree those things make sense. Taking those common sense things that we should be doing, and we would say, yeah, I, I, I want to be doing it, but we don't end up doing, and putting it in a framework so that we can actually make them happen. That's, what I, that's been my experience with Scrum. It's, it's enabling those things of, with collaboration, adapting a plan, um, you know, process or people over processes and tools, it enables those things to happen more easily. And so this diagram kind of gives you a general overview of the parts. And so we start on the left here with what's called a product backlog, and that's really just your list of features, the things that we're going to do that's going to encompass this product. And this could be, if you're a sales team, this could be your list of, of prospects for sales. It doesn't have to be software. So we start, with our, we start with our product backlog, which we've also prioritized according to business value. And now we're going to take a small piece of that, and we're going to work on it in, in a sprint. And a sprint is a time box. It can be uh, two weeks. Uh, it can be four weeks. It's generally not more than a month. Some people do one. Uh, we tend to do one or two in our projects. So for a, for a time box iteration, we're going to pick a small subset of that, and we're going to work on that. And at the end, we're going to end up with something complete, right? We're going to have part of this product done, like as in coded, tested, accepted. This is actually working software. And we could ship it if we had enough of it, or we could release it you know, on the web or whatever. Um, and during that iteration, we'll meet together as a team once a day for 15 minutes, just as a check-in. We call it our, our daily scrum meeting, and I'll talk more about that. Okay, so let's look at this product backlog a little bit. So here I have a project I'm calling Grocery Trip, and I have my backlog of um, what I'm calling user stories, and user stories is just a way of describing uh, features in the system. And I've ranked them according to high, medium, and low. So I've got a bunch of them here, and you can see I've also got some, some estimated values in what's called points, and I'll talk about points in a little bit. Um, and so I'm going to I'm going to basically want to do the things that are at the top of the list here first. And you can see they're just they're very simple statements written in a non-technical way. So if I'm going to go on this trip, I have to make sure I have enough gas in the van so I can get home. Right? So I've got to make sure I check the, uh, you know, the tank, make sure there's enough there. If not, I've got to go get gas at the, the gas station. And so this becomes basically my, my feature plan for this, this project. And each of these features is, has three parts to it. We call a card, conversation, and confirmation. So the idea, again, is we're getting away from a lot of heavy upfront documentation here. We have, typically, if you're working with a team face-to-face, -face, um, 
they'll write on things like this, basically a, an index card. And the index card, will, you clearly can't write very much on an index card. So you will write something like, you know, uh, make sure I have enough, you know, I have enough gas to get home. Could be, could be a feature. And then by working with your customer, you will flesh out more of the details through conversation as opposed to getting them all down in a, in a detailed spec. And it's through these conversations that you get a better understanding of what needs to happen. And the confirmation comes in what's called a series of acceptance tests. So basically, a few short statements that describe um, business scenarios that would then prove that the story is done. So there's less subjectivity on whether or not a feature is complete or not. Um, I was just working on one this morning for some internal work that we're doing, and it was, it was basically a feature where we could um, add a certain role to a bunch of users in a system. And so we wrote a bunch of acceptance tests where basically, so we said, well, if we add you know, such and such a role, then all of these users will, will have that role in, in addition to the, the roles that we had before. And then we, we created another acceptance test where we tried on, say, a thousand users for you know, a, big, a bigger group. So basically, a bunch of these acceptance tests become um, the factor in deciding whether or not the story is complete. And they're tests that can be often automated um, by the team. So it gives them a sense for, A, what this story is supposed to do, um, and B, gives them a way to actually automate and prove that they've uh, completed that story. So another part, of course, of working a project is trying to figure out, well, how much effort do we need in order to complete the project? And so um, typically, we're pretty bad at that. Um, estimating is not a good skill that we tend to have as, as humans. Um, and we're actually really bad at estimating um, uh, in terms of accuracy. What I mean by that is, I once was given an example of where people were kind of polled on, say, how high the Empire State Building was. And the range was just out of this world. I mean, people had such a different, varying difference on, on actual distance. But if I was to ask you, you know, how much bigger is this compared to this, I think we could reasonably agree that maybe this is, say, three times as, as big as that. And so uh, what we try to do to get better estimates is we break the, the, the task down into two parts. First, we deal with the size of things. How big are these features? How, how much more effort is it going to be to get this one versus this one? And so we end up with relative sizings, and we do that with something called story points. And different teams do different things. They're just arbitrary things. Um, they don't mean anything other than as a relative comparison. Some people use t-shirt sizes, small, medium, large. Um, we tend to use a Fibonacci sequence in, in what we do. Um, and I actually have a planning poker deck set which uses the Fibonacci numbers, so one, two, three, five, eight, and so on. Um, so once you've got your relative sizings, which again, it, you can do much more quickly than guessing how many hours it takes to do something and get agreement on quickly, then you try to figure out as a team, how many of, the, how many of these points can we get done in, a, say, a, a two-week iteration? And you'll know that over time as you, as you measure. But when you take, so let's say um, we have 25 stories, and we estimate that in total that's going to be 200 story points when we add up all the story point estimations. And we've got two week iterations that we're working in. So uh, we figured out that we can get about 40 points done in a two week iteration. That means we're going to need about five iterations or 10 weeks to get this project done. So first we get the size, then we figure out how many points we could get done in, in a time box and then multiply that by your time box to figure out how much, um, basically what your schedule is going to be to get this project done. So it, it, not only is it more accurate, it's actually a little more fun. As I said, uh, we use something called planning poker, and uh, I don't know if anyone likes cards, but it's, it's a much more humane way I find to estimate as a team um, than <coughs> trying to, try to haggle it. The other part about this that's good is because is you're estimating as a team, you can balance off your biases, right? Maybe somebody always estimates too low or someone doesn't <coughs> think of something. When you come to the table and everybody 
puts in a number and then they compare their numbers and find out why they're different, a lot of things emerge and everyone gets a better understanding of what actually needs to be done and you end up with a much better number than if one person had done it on their own. Any questions about that? But, right, so everybody on the team would have to be involved in the same discipline, like coding or whatever. You're not going to get uh, people from uh, you know, outside of the discipline contributing to time estimates. Well, so the question was, um, you know, who, who uh, I'll try and get there. Um, I just wanted dessert. <laughs> I got a lot more here, so uh, I'm going to eat a lot of raisins for lunch and I'll get more questions. Um, so the question was, who, who gets involved with the estimates? Well, it's only the people on the team. Client doesn't estimate. Um, no, no one estimates except those people on the team. And they should be a balanced team. It should be coders, it should be testers, designers, and so on. They all bring their own perspective. And each of these stories has a bit of work from each of them, typically, right? We're developing a feature which is going to have to be coded, designed, tested, and so on. So everyone plays a piece in that story, as opposed to um, splitting stories according to discipline. What we want is what we want is basically to, to make a slice through the cake. If a cake is our is our system, we want to create a story that goes through everything, not creating like a database layer and a, and a visual layer. But we want something that's going to go through all of those layers for each story. And lastly, the team has to commit. So when they're estimating um, these stories for an iteration they'll decide how much they can take on as a team. And then they're going to commit to that. And the, that act of working together and deciding you know, um, how, how, long it's, how much effort it's going to be to do these stories, and then how much they feel they can take on based on past experience and so on. Um, by the fact that they're deciding what they can accomplish, that buy-in motivates the team and, and compels them to deliver. Um, and again, it's done as a team, not as individuals, which, again, is another effective way to um, get work done. So earlier I was talking about a, a daily stand-up. So these are, again, very quick uh, check-ins to coordinate and surface problems. Everyone answers three questions. So what did we do since the last stand-up? What did we do yesterday? What are we going to do today? Or what are you going to do today? And are there any obstacles in your way? So again, surface those issues earlier so they, they can get resolved and also <coughs> coordinate, coordinate what people are doing. Sometimes somebody might need help with something, so two team members will decide to work together on something, or somebody might have a, uh, you know, knowledge of something that someone else uh, requires. So these, these check-in meetings just help us try to keep on track. Um, another thing that we do on a daily basis is we use what's called a burn-down chart. And before I had this thing, as a project manager, which is what I, I used to do, I would never know if we were actually going to get stuff done until maybe the day before the deadline was there, which was an awful feeling. With the burn down chart, on a daily basis, I can see, the team can see, how are we doing? Are we on track? Because what it's measuring is the time remaining on all of the work to be done in the particular sprint. Right? So we may estimate that you know, in this iteration, it's going to take us you know, 100 hours to get all these tasks done. But as we get into it, we discover, well, this task, which we thought was five hours, is now turning into eight hours. This chart will reflect that, because it's updated on a daily basis, the time remaining on tasks. So as tasks get completed, it burns down, obviously. As we add new tasks, or we add more time to tasks, it will go up. So we measure this red line, which is our actual, against the blue, which is sort of the ideal. If we got the same amount done every day until the end of the iteration, it would burn down to zero, and we'd be done exactly what we thought we would do. So if this line is, is above, we're a bit in trouble. If we're below, then we're actually ahead of the game. Um, so this just gives us a decision tool earlier in the process to make choices. Like maybe we need to cut back a bit on how we were going to implement some user stories, or you know, maybe there's a problem that's occurring that we need to address with testing or something like that. Maybe there's some delay by someone else that's plaguing this thing. Well, this is a nice visual thing to show to management that says, that says, hey, get this problem out of the way, get that hardware ordered or whatever it is. So it's a very useful, very useful metric. Yes, Tim? Jerry, when I'm looking at this chart, I don't see, maybe I'm missing something, but the number of hours spent is one thing, but whether you're or not you're 
getting accomplished what you hope to accomplish in that time frame is a factor that I don't see here. Well, this isn't measuring actual time. This is measuring time remaining. So when we start, the team has estimated 600 man hours for this sprint. So it's a 31 day sprint. Yeah. So it's a full month. So they're estimating to get everything that they plan to do done, it's going to take them 600 hours. So every day, they're updating the task to say, okay, now there's three hours remaining on this task. Now there's two hours remaining on this task. You take the sum of that, of everything remaining, and you plot that every day. So, e so each, each day you're getting something done, right? So that chart should be burning down. So, so the man hours represents the, the points that you have estimated the cost as opposed to the actual man hours. Well, yeah, I guess one thing I could be clear on here is when I was talking about story points earlier, um, typically that gets done more at the release plan level when you're thinking beyond just a two week or a one month sprint. What, what typically happens in a sprint is you start with a, a planning meeting where you take that, those, say, say you figure you're gonna get about eight stories done per sprint. So you take the next eight highly prioritized things from your big product backlog and you look at those in your planning meeting and you start breaking them into tasks and put real hours against them, okay? So you go from points to then hours in your iteration because you're just dealing with a smaller subset. You're gonna get a lot more detailed in those stories. So you're gonna put real hours against those tasks and then you're gonna measure how many hours are left on those tasks as you go through the sprint. Man hours is really like a task duration measurement. Right. How long the task So a story is. might have four tasks and those four tasks together add up to 16 hours. And, and you probably have a more granular view of this as well in the spreadsheet where you can actually tell which resources miss their particular task in that sprint. So you can know where the problem lay. I mean, this kind sure. of only says you're a little off track with that sprint. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is just an overall, an overall progress indicator. Yeah, the team, the team obviously needs a much better dashboard in which to see what's what's going on. Um, the other thing that happens in the sprint at the very end, and this is kind of the, the fun part, especially if the sprint's gone really well, is we demonstrate working software. So early and often, the client is seeing something that's actually complete. So whether it's a two-week sprint or a four-week, whatever, at the end of that sprint. You get together with your client and whoever else wants to come. Sometimes they turn into little parties and bring snacks and things. And the team will actually demonstrate those finished user stories according to the acceptance tests that were, that were written. So it gives the client a chance to see software that's working and coded and completed, demonstrated, and provide some feedback. And often that generates new ideas, right? Because as we get into a project, we discover new things or new ideas or new problems. And all of that stuff then can then be thrown back into our backlog and prioritized with everything else for the next sprint. So every sprint, we have a chance to um, adjust the plan. We put new things in, we reprioritize, and then take, again, the top stuff from the, our backlog and put that into the next sprint. It's, I've also found um, team members really like this because oftentimes it's, it's very affirming, right? The client is seeing the stuff, they're getting positive feedback. We had one yesterday. Um, and you know, the team feels great. The client was excited. Um, you know, first two weeks into the project, and already there's finished stuff. So, how yes. much, how much in these sort of uh, modular meetings, where you these milestones that you're hitting and showing them progress and certain parts of software are working, in those meetings, how often or does it happen, and how do you deal with it? Scope creep. So, if the guy comes in and says, "Yeah, it looks great. Can we add this and this and this?" or it a bit this way sure. and it affects other things down the line mm -hmm. and so on. How so, do you manage that? So the question is, is about scope creep. Well, I guess part of it would depend on how you set up your contract. But what we try to do is, is again, um, to, to pull things in and out. Like what, what I said earlier is, is usually you start at the beginning of a project with a huge laundry list of stuff. And as you get into it, you realize, well, a bunch of the stuff actually we don't really need. You know, we thought we needed it, but it, it's not that valuable to us. So pull something out of the backlog that you don't need anymore and pull, put in that new thing of roughly the same size so your scope stays the same. That's one way to do it. Um, so you'd have to have at the beginning, at the very beginning with the client, you have to say, okay, it's not a standard contract where it's beginning and end, here's the budget, you're working on modular pieces, and depending on how happy or unhappy you are, we'll adjust the plan going forward. There's, there's a lot of variations. I'm actually, I'm actually 
organizing a working group right now dealing with agile contracts because it's it's actually a there's so many different flavors, but not a lot of um, it's still a fairly new thing. Yeah. But um, you can do agile with fixed cost, fixed scope, fixed everything if you want to. I mean, there's obviously it has its own fixed everything has its own problems. Um, but typically, yeah, what we do is is if you want to make a change, or if you want to add something in, just pull something out. That's not as valuable, right? Give the client the ability to make those changes. That's valuable to them, but they have to recognize if they're adding more. Yeah. Got to increase the budget, or they've got to take something out. But the, the, the thing that I, often, I find what happens sometimes too is there's a debate over well, you know, that should have been in there, right? You know, you did that feature, but you know, you didn't include that. I've felt that pain many times. And what the way we're dealing with that now is, like, I'm meeting with a client on Monday, and we're going to have a formal definition of done, which the team will agree to, which the client will agree to. So we'll say basically. In order for a story to be considered complete, this is the criteria. And it will come down to the acceptance tests that are written that they all have to pass, basically. And so if an acceptance test got missed, right, if they thought about it later, well, that's fine. We'll just add it to the backlog for the next sprint. But it means, you know, something else isn't going to get done. So. Um, another thing that's really valuable is at the end of each sprint we do what's called a retrospective. So the team gets together and the idea here is continuous improvement. So, you know, there's a, this can be very formal, this can be like a two, three, four hour thing. There's lots of different exercises of ways to reflect, but it can also be very simple. It can be just a matter of going around the circle and saying, okay, what worked well? You know, what kind of sucked? What, what do we need to improve? What do we want, what do we want to keep on doing? And so as a team, and oftentimes with the client too, um, just talk about how things are going and then come up with a few action items that you want to do in the next sprint. So in our last sprint with this particular client, we had some communication issues. Um, weren't getting answers in time. Um, in, in one case, we were dealing with a, a third party that we were waiting for something on and realizing the process is slow. So we're going to you know, deal, with, deal with that by you know, providing more leeway time before we require those things in a further sprint. You know, push those stories back even farther so there's enough time for those things to get into place. Those are the kinds of discussions you can have when you kind of step back from the work you're doing and, and try to figure out, you know, what's, what's not working. So that we're always continuously improving. Just out of interest, Jerry, that last slide you showed, it had the different cards, um, colors meaning priority or? Uh, well, I pulled up this one actually from a, a blog post. He's using a technique, and I've, I've been a part of a few of these sessions. There's a lot of different techniques to try to pull out discussion, right? So sometimes um, you want to get everyone to participate, but maybe some people don't feel like they will. So you start off with you know, maybe asking everyone to say one or two words about how they're feeling about the project or the process or whatever, just to get this conversation going. Um, and then they might be using cards to say you know, things that are working well or not well, or maybe they have different categories. Um, it could, could be a variety of things that way. Um, I've also, I was in a session where we used <coughs> the DOTS voting technique. So everyone came up with like, you know, 10, 20 different things that they wanted to look at. And then as a group to decide, okay, which are the ones that are most important, everyone had four DOTS. And they had to put the DOTS on, on the cards. And obviously the ones with the most DOTS were the ones that we took a bit closer look at. So it's a way to quickly get some consensus um, with, a, with a large group. Um, another role that's, that's in Scrum is called a Scrum Master, and that's a lot of what I do actually. It's kind of like the team coach. You're helping them understand the practices and, and, the, and the framework of Scrum, but you're also just trying to help them be productive. So sometimes that means you're the sheepdog and you've got to you know, bark at the client who's, who's getting in the way sometimes, or, or maybe at management who's not providing the stuff that the team needs. You know, this, this person works for the team, as opposed to a project manager who directs the team. That's the big difference with Agile and typical software development is now the project manager works for the team, you know, the scrum master. So we don't have somebody directing the team now. The, the team is, is directing themselves. I mean, not in an island, of course. There's still, there's still direction for management and such. But the scrum master is there to help the team be as productive as possible, work through issues, help them resolve things, help them come up with ideas um, to, to problems. Uh, get them the resources they need 
um, facilitate the retrospectives, that kind of stuff. Um, another important element, and this isn't necessarily just a scrum thing, but you have to have a balanced team, right? If you're going to be agile and flexible, they have to be able to do more than just one thing. Um, so you want a team that's got a variety of skills, but also is willing to take on a variety of things, right? Maybe your database guy doesn't have a lot of work to do, but he can help with testing. So you've got a few stories happening that have to get done, so the team pulls together to get those stories done. Um, you want a team that's full-time as much as possible because of the cost of context switching. It's really awful once you get past two projects. Um, I've experienced that pain, a lot of you probably have to as well. Um, minimize the context switching. If you've got projects that all seem to have to get done at the same time, one option is to do a sprint in one project and then switch to the other one for the next sprint. But trying to do both at the same time is a recipe for disaster as far as your efficiency goes. Um, and again, the self-organizing thing. So the more the teams self-organize, the more motivated they are, the more efficient they'll be. Who does, who does the assignment of tasks? Like, there's got to be, like, is there a scrum master who says, okay, we're going to divide it up this way, and what does everyone think? Maybe we'll do a couple other tasks. Is it, is so, it organic? Is it, how does it work? So the question is, who, who assigns the tasks? Well, when we do our planning, when we have our plan for the iteration, there is no name beside any task. So in those stand-ups, that's when people are selecting tasks as a team. And we're doing it according to priority. So whatever story is in there that has the, the highest priority, that's the one we're working on first. You can't start working on this one down here. You have to work on the one at the top. And we try not to have too many stories going on at one time, right? So you've got two or three people. You know, if you've got, say, a team of five, you may have two, maybe three stories going. But you want the whole team focused on a couple stories rather than a whole bunch of threads going on at the same time. So the team picks their own tasks. The scrum master might help them figure out what's, you know, what needs to be happening or give them suggestions, but it's up to the team. Well, like, on a volunteer basis, on a, if I think you should do this, you're good at this. I mean, generally what happens is even though you don't assign names, people generally know what things are, they're good at. But again, it comes back to that thing where if there's a story that's got testing, designing, and coding, and if that story has to get done and you've got time, well maybe you're not the tester, but you can help write some tests or you can help pair with someone on some code that isn't your responsibility but somebody needs help doing. So the idea is the whole team pitches in to get stories done. One story, then another story, then another story, not a whole bunch of stories happening at the same time. <clears throat> One other question about the user stories. A lot of times there are situations where you, you're designing the system itself you have to put a framework in place before you can design the application. Where does that sit? I mean, it's not really a user story. It's a lot of background work you need to do. And if you're going to show your software within two weeks, and it's got to be running, um, e even, even on a limited basis, you still have a lot of work to do to get to that point. So how do you make sure that that's given uh, the correct weight in that system? Can't blame you that time. <laughs> so the question is, what do you do in a situation where you've got a whole bunch of upfront architecture stuff that you have to do in order to just even make a little bit of progress? Well, um, I don't have a perfect answer for that, but some of the things that I've heard is um, one of the things you want to do before you even get into your iteration work is you want someone to often to be your architect for the team, right? Someone who's someone who's responsible for the direction in which it's heading. From a, from a technical architecture perspective. And then you want to test your architecture, but just enough to make sure that it's, it's what you think it's what you need it to be. So you want to, you, want to, you want to basically tie the systems together in a minimal way, just enough to know that it's going to hang together. Okay, so you might have a bunch of mock objects or things in the various systems so that it will demonstrate that, yeah, this looks like it's a feasible architecture. And then build just enough architecture that you need to get to that, that next iteration. So again, the idea is, is you know, do again, just, just enough, enough that you need um, to, to keep <coughs> moving forward. If, if something's a huge risk, you identify that, you know, do enough to mitigate that risk too. So that you then, you know, you want to go forward. The problem is, if you do too much architecture in the beginning, um, you have this, this 
huge architected system, and then you end up with no budget at the end, or a bunch of the stuff you learn later, well, we didn't really need that, then you've wasted all that, that time. So the idea is to get stuff out there as quickly as possible, because that's where really where you learn and understand if this is the right direction to go in or not. James? Um, I was just considering that, depending on, like, you need to consider your design, like, I, I would say that you need to consider your design for all of your intended features before you make decisions about your architecture, right? Like, if you're, like, you can't, like, just be putting in architecture according to function, the, the, the specific function that you want to implement, because you're going to obviously implement the architecture that's most, you know, the best for that function, but maybe it'll totally not work for some other function you're going to work on down the road. Like, I, I could say <coughs> if you're not careful about it, you'd end up with just a big, big spider web of, of, of like, confusion. Right. by the time that you get a little further down the development chain because you've been thinking about one one function at a time and not, not realizing that you're going to have to implement all these other, other things later on. Sure, the same argument to doing a lot of architecture <coughs> applies to, say, doing a whole lot of design, right? Um, spend a lot of money and budget just focusing on design. But when you, when you take stories that go through the entire system that have design, architecture, coding, all that within it, then that, that's really more of a test and an understanding of where this thing needs to go. Um, with design stuff, you know, we tend to do um, high-level wireframes and that sort of thing. Not trying to plug everything into it, but at least have a high-level understanding of, you know, we, we do websites, so, you know, basically trying to get the big picture, the branding, and that sort of thing, get a lot of that in place before we start our iterative work, but we're not trying to bang everything out in the design right away. We do that iteratively in our, in our iterations. The designers are working a little bit ahead of the coders so that the design stuff's ready in time for them to do the coding, but not too far ahead. Sounds, so sounds we put a lot of effort in up front in the Scrum process to prioritize which features and functionality are important. And so if you pick your top you know, priorities, then that would also say which architecture is immediate need, immediately needed as right. well. Right. Yeah, the so person in charge of architecture probably wants to be aware of all the lesser priority items or possible future implications. Sure, I mean, when you're dealing with architecture, you, you're looking at the big picture. And so you sort of need to know the, the scope of where you're going. But again, the idea with Agile is is you know, just, just enough. Just enough planning, just enough coding, just enough testing to, to keep moving forward, um, rather than a big upfront heavy process that in the end doesn't validate itself until you've actually done working code. Seems to me like it sounds like it's prototyping. Where um, you're kind of getting a bunch of small prototypes out and then in the end putting it all together. Well, this comment is what is, it feels kind of like prototyping. Well, it isn't, it isn't, because it's actually finished product. You're actually delivering working stuff. You may decide to evolve it, and because you're doing it iteratively, there's a lot of that notion of improving as you go. So you don't have to get it perfect the first time, but you're actually. You're just taking your focus on, on a smaller piece of the pie and getting that working really, really well and really well understood because it's the most important thing you should be doing right now, basically. So I've just got a few more slides here, a lot of great questions. So I've been talking a little bit about process from a project point of view. There's some pretty key technical fundamentals too to any successful team, any successful project. And I'm not going to delve into them too much, but these four are pretty much proven. There's, there's not much you can say against not doing these things. Um, and any team that isn't doing these things, they can have the best collaboration, they can have the best scrum meetings, the best estimation in the world. But if you're not doing these things, the chances of you producing really high quality code in a productive, efficient way are pretty close to zero. Um, I pretty, feel pretty strongly about that. So test-driven development, focusing on tests before you write code, continuous integration, which means as you're writing stuff, the stuff you, <coughs> you wrote before is, is part of that testing, making sure everything's fitting together. Pair programming, that's where you get away from silo development, where people know one part of the system and nothing else, or no one else knows it. You have to worry about the Mack truck coming down the road to hit them. So again, people working together, um, taking responsibility for knowing more of the system for sharing skills. Um, code refactoring, that's a huge one. And a lot of people don't budget that into their, their plans, and clients need to be aware of this. There's a tax, 
there's a tax for your code, and you're either going to pay it in small installments, or you're going to pay it huge later when you have to do a massive rewrite of your system. So the idea with Agile is to pay it in smaller increments along the way. As you're writing, as you're working on code, if you see stuff that needs to be refactored, you do it at that point. You don't wait six months later when the whole thing is just falling apart. You refactor it continually um, so that that code is, is tested and modular and, and efficient. And Jerry, again for a second, that's also part of the answer to your question before about the architecture. So let's say if you want to provide a website to support a million users, the initial sprint you might do, as long as it can support a thousand, that's okay. It definitely be architecturally a lot more complex to support a million, but right now you're just focusing on the thousand, make sure that it works. Once you have it up and running, you've proven it. Then as part of one of the next sprints, you can say, okay, now we need to make it, let's say 100,000. Then the next step is a million, right? So then you do it incrementally. And part of it, you will have to effectively take all the code that you developed before and junk it, but that's okay. That's part of the progress. At the beginning, you proved what needed to be proved and it was useful for the, for the customer. Great example. So I don't have a knowledge. A lot of I don't have much knowledge about these things because I I don't deal so much with the technical things. But I, I just know that these are things that, that need to get done um, if you want to have a high performing team. So so the last part of this is okay. So we've heard about Scrum. Um, do we need a tool to implement this thing? Right. Everyone everyone likes tools. I like tools. Um, well. Yes and no. This is a very effective tool, and uh, Mark Delcido is here can 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 talk to that. They use Scrum in work group designs here in Sioux. And when I was first learning about Scrum, I actually visited Mark to learn about Scrum. And uh, this is very common for teams that work together. Um, Lo-fi is better than high high tech. So this is basically a board that shows a product backlog on the left hand side. It has the tasks to do across the middle. A burn down chart near the bottom. Um, it has a column showing tasks in progress, and at the very, at the very far end, all of the completed tasks. What's nice about this is it's very visual. Everyone can see it, get a pretty clear picture of where we're at, at a very high level, right? If there's a lot of stuff that's in the done column, that's pretty good. If if that's looking pretty empty towards the end of the iteration, we've got some problems. It's also it's, it's also nobody controls it. The whole team can just walk up to the board. They can move stuff around and add stuff to it so the team can manage this together. It's not one project manager holding onto an Excel spreadsheet and, and, and controlling it themselves. So unfortunately, I've always worked remote, so I've never had the opportunity to work in this kind of environment, which I'd love to do. Um, so if you do work in a distributed team, like everyone I work with is either based in Argentina or in Atlanta, and the clients are wherever. Um, we actually wrote our own scrum tool, so we got sick of the ones that were out there, and uh, called Agilito. And this is just an example of a, a dashboard for the team. So this is an iteration in a project. And at the bottom, you can see we have our list of uh, five stories. And one of them's highlighted in red, which means this one's blocked, <coughs> or something preventing it from moving forward. We have you know various states and, and time remainings. And you can see we have our, our burn down chart, which shows, uh, shows our progress. So these are, like, these are all based on sprints, right? also have a tool or a methodology to look at the whole big picture of the whole project of based on either on a bunch of past sprints that we've done and the ones looking forward? Um, not or sure you just concentrate and wait on the sprints? Oh, well, uh, we also have to, I mean, two things. So he's, you're asking me about sort of looking at the release in general. You can do the same types of burn down charts for a whole release, right? You can, you can also see how are we doing as far as our release is going. Um, iteration by iteration. How many, you'll, you'll typically have, say, 200 stories for your release. Well, how many have we gotten done by this point versus how many we plan to get done? Um, there are other charts as well that we haven't been using that we're going to start using in our projects, which will actually show the burn down of budget, right? So here's our projected burn down, where are we actually at? Things like that are very useful for the client um, to do. So there's, there's a lot of different metrics you can use. Yes, Ernie? It appears that you could use a 
Hey, Ernie, you're really going to make me work harder for this one. <laughs> hey! hey. <All> right. <laughs> um, you could. I've never used one, and I hope I never will. Um, well, I, I, used to, I used to use them back in, in MS Project days. Um, if you were to use a Gantt chart, it would only be because your project management dictated it. I don't see any other reason to. And the way you would, you would do a Gantt chart for this is basically you would have your two-week window or whatever it is for your iteration. You would span every story across those two weeks. And then you would do another iteration for the next two weeks and span your stories across those two weeks. That would be your MS Project Gantt chart. But it's well, I know MS Project is a complex Right. You could, again, I, I think there are, there are more effective visuals. It would be a visuals. lot of management to do that. Yeah. We, I, I have similar problems in our company because our management likes to see the Gantt charts, but mm -hmm. you know, they're trying to accommodate the Scrum thing. It's, it's difficult to right. report what they want to see, but at the same time do what we want to do, which we feel makes us efficient. So uh, the Gantt thing is the problem we had at the beginning. They made me do them. And it was a lot of work to, to map what we were doing in Scrum to the equivalent in the Gantt chart. Well, what? Just because the yeah. things are being split. What I suggested wasn't my idea. It, it came from a guy named Mike Cohn, who I had the fortune of going to one of his training sessions. One of the original signers of the Agile Manifesto, brilliant guy, um, was on the team that helped develop the Olympic system that IBM did. Um, so his suggestion was, if you got to do grant charts, yeah, basically split it into iterations, you know, and show your stories in that iteration over that window. You know, it's a simple, it's easy to understand. If you want a Gantt chart, it's a Gantt chart. What's your visual for showing the dependencies between the different sprints and, and maybe uh, just seeing the milestones with each sprint all at once? So the question is, how do you show all the, the iterations? Well, I was just thinking of what I've used Gantt charts for before. Mm -hmm. and, and you could actually show um, you know, the timing of when the different sprints, in this case, would align and control the project time frame and uh, how far along you were on those. Well, typically in, in, in Agile, if you want to show progress, you're using things like, like burn down charts. Um, we don't, I've never had to really think so much about dependencies between stories in different iterations. I mean, you're basically just, you deal with dependencies by, by prioritizing, right? So, so first you have your, your customer prioritizing by business value. The team looks at the stories and talks to the product owner who's responsible for prioritizing and says, well, you know, based on, on, on our needs, we're going to need to shift things around a little bit. So they, they, they make the, the, the business case to the product owner to make some changes um, that just deal with dependencies that way. Yeah. Dependencies hasn't really been a, a major sticking point. I think the question is, you know that picture you had up before where it showed what the backlog is and what the tasks you're working on, what's in progress and what's done? Mm -hmm. What is, is there another visual like this that displays that instead of putting stickies on a board, on a post-it board or something? like? Because I think that's what he's asking. You want the big project in general, mm -hmm. like exactly what you showed there, but is there some kind of software that does that? Here, do you mind if I jump in for a second? And this is only my limited experience. Um, everybody, or not everybody, but it tends to be in North America, there's a lot of the, we're used to the waterfall methodology, right? Where you have the standard, okay, at the beginning, I'm gonna, I have a huge project, and at the beginning, I'm going to spend time designing it, then I'm going to spend time coding it, then I'm going to spend time testing it, then I'm going to spend time verifying, then I actually roll it out, and I just like kill it. And everything is the, dependent on the very beginning, so I make a very detailed plan at the beginning, and I don't give anything to my customer until the very end. At the very end, I hope that the initial requirements were correct, because I spent six months, a year, five years, depending on how long the plan was, and then I give it all in one shot. The whole point about Scrum is, when you, have, when you are in, a, in an area that has an incredibly high turnover of requirements, so the requirements that you're given at the beginning may very well change when you're about a third of the way through. So instead of waiting until the end and then delivering something that it's no longer useful to the customer, you're actually sprinting along and you're giving quick, 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 quick. So I was in a field where you know, within six months, which is what it took to give us a complete end product, the requirements had changed. 
And by the time we gave it to the customer, there's like, well, that's really not what we need anymore. So we were shifting into Scrum from that perspective. We wanted to give them to, in two months we gave them something. And then they had the opportunity of saying, great, now instead of continuing where we were gonna go before, we actually wanna change and go this way instead. So you had that flexibility. So Scrum, it's not an answer to everything. So for example, military contracts, where well, they know exactly what it is and it's a five year duration, you don't wanna go there. But if it's something for high technology which changes quickly, Scrum is perfect. Yeah, that's, that's a good example. And I was going to say, too, another thing that, that can often happen is um, you may end up with a plan that you think it's going to take a year and a half to, to deliver a project. But when it's, it's done according to priority and, and business value, there's, there's a lot of examples where you know, companies realize, you know, hey, we can release this to market in six months. We've got enough value. We've done enough value in six months. Let's release it now instead of a year later and get a jump on the competition. right? Or realize you know, we don't need to do that other 80% that we thought we had to do, this 20% is it's fantastic, let's stop now. You know, that's what allows you to do. To talk a bit to the dependency question, it doesn't have to be full linear dependency either. And that's the big difference with Scrum. You don't have to have 100% of the original, say, block A done before you can start the work on block B, because you can do the first 20% of block A. At the same time, start the first 20% of block B, and then stagger it through your iterations. And and clarify, I wasn't thinking of the waterfall approach, I was thinking of the, the rational. So rational approach, also yeah. those iterations, which right. are past starting I still need for that traction could be a Gantt chart. So I was just kind of wondering, like Trevor said, what you showed as post-it notes on that big board before, how you could kind of visualize where you were for all those different sprints. Right. It, it, it didn't sound like there was a digital thing other than possibly the burn down chart. Well, th there's lots of tools that can generate whatever metrics you, you want, but typically the ones that get used are burn down charts. Um, and as I said, uh, there's some other ones I've seen around, around you know, budget burn down and such. So. Um, we, have, we don't tend to use a lot of metrics in our stuff. Well, yeah, can I discuss the grubby issue of money? Um, how do you, how does this, when you have to talk better proposal to submit to a client, and you're using this methodology, if you're using the old Gantt chart, I don't necessarily agree with your interpretation of how projects work, but that's yeah. funny. At least part of that, when you have a Gantt chart up and running, you've got about 25 or 30 different charts you can take out of there, mm -hmm. and different presentations and different formats. One of which is price. Uh, how do you cost this thing out? And second of all, does it save you any money? And does it, it's not you, I don't care about it. Right. Money. Does it save the client any money in the long run? Because if he's got to go to all these meetings and all these reviews, and it's not, if it's got to cost him more money, he's not interested. Right. And I guess there's a third part too. And you can pass on thank you very much. How do you convince old talkers like me if this is worthwhile? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's well, the dog. I, <laughs> I think my, my experience, I mean, most clients that we deal with aren't familiar with Agile, and they, they, there's sort of a false sense of security with dealing with fixed price and, and fixed cost. That's not, it's, it's, a, it's really a false sense of security. Um, when they start getting into Agile and they start actually getting to interact with the team. I have a client talking with the, the real developers who are going to be working on the system, not some middle person who's a project manager. They understand pretty quickly whether they're getting it or not, right? I have clients really, I've had clients really like that, right? Now they realize, okay, we're connecting here or we're not connecting here. Um, and it's much more efficient than trying to write a bunch of stuff down and have someone else interpret it. No matter how well you write it, something's going to get misunderstood. So I'm, I'm kind of swaying around here a bit, but in terms of the money thing, um, that's that's something we're we're still working hard at, and it's 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 a real struggle. Um, there are a lot of different models of doing agile contracts, and again, as I said, I'm work, I'm in a working group right now to try to publish some um, Creative Commons examples so that we can get past this because it's a much better way of working. In terms of costing, um, again, you're trying not to do a lot of that big, heavy upfront stuff, right? Which costs a lot of time and a lot of money before you see anything real. So, in terms of the value of the client, they're seeing stuff much, much earlier. They're getting finished stuff done. If they wanted to end a project early, they wouldn't have a bunch of sort of straight ends um, resembling a project. They would actually have a bunch of finished stuff done that they could take and use. So, they also have the Again, the ability to make a lot of changes within the process, which I find is pretty valuable to clients. 
because they're used to the, because they get in a situation where you know it's fixed scope. Well, this is what we wanted. Well, then they realize well actually it really wasn't what we want. What we want. You know, we realize we need to make changes. How are we going to do that? It's nice if there's a simple way to, to make that change. Yes, Ernie. Yeah, I, um Yeah, there's something called target cost or target scope contracts, which is what you're talking about. Um, and there's also there's also other models too. Um, we're, we've been talking about one where where you have a, uh, a f you have a, a fixed initial set where you're doing your, your your release planning and so on. You're doing your your prototyping and whatnot. So you sort of you have a bit of a, a fixed upfront part. So that provides some stability. And once you have a better sense of the project, then you can move more into a more agile, flexible. Uh, but that's another way to, to do it. Um, there's a lot of different ways. There's an interesting one called Money for Nothing, Change for Free, um, which Jeff Sutherland um, is promoting. Um, the idea there is you're both working to end the project early. The idea is again, the idea again is you really don't need to get all this stuff done. You think you do when you start off in the project, but you realize partway through we've got enough value here. Why would we spend more money on stuff that's going to not give us a high enough return? So both the client and the, the the vendor are working to try to end the project early. The vendor gets a premium on what's left over, so his margin goes up, and the client gets the project out earlier and spends less money. So there's a lot of different flavors. Do you find that <clears throat> that actually changes the way people program or develop? There's a term called YAGMI, which is uh, you're not going to need it, where programmers oftentimes, if you give them the time, will really like to polish what they're doing, and sometimes it's not necessary. Really, right. you get in front of the, your client and, and they say, well, this is good enough. Why can't I have this right now? You know? Sure. Um, I think one thing I haven't touched upon too much today, which I think is also really, really important, is, is there are certain values that I think a team has to adopt. And, and oftentimes, teams will put together what they call their working agreement as a team. Teams need to recognize they're not writing code. They're delivering value. And when the focus is always on value, they need to be <coughs> they need to be the ones looking for ways to remove the fat. They need to be looking for ways to get something out early. But they also need to be doing it in a way that they have the time to write code properly, to test properly. A lot of times there's pressure just to get things done. You have to give the team, you have to, you have to let the team work at a pace that's sustainable and allows them to write you know, the quality code that's going to be maintained. So it's, it's, yeah, it's a different way of You don't thinking. often get a chance to go back and rewrite something. Right. You know, when when you deliver something, or you want to deliver something, um, usually that's, you know, if you're working in a waterfall, and that's, that's the end of the project right there. You give it to them, you know, after testing and whatnot. Um, it makes sense to necessarily work in uh, test-driven development into your process where um, you're ready the, the, the correct way the first time, as opposed to going back and fixing small things that, well, It'd be nice if it was always working right the first time. And you know, I think you have a better chance of, of, of getting there. But again, with, with Agile, the idea is that you can, you can refactor, right? So the first time through, actually, there's, there's good arguments to say, don't get it perfect the first time. Just get it working to see, is this the direction we want to go in? And then refactor it and, and make it much more clean and much more polished in the next iteration or, or wherever is appropriate. So That's uh, what I was kind of saying about prototyping. Right. You kind of want to get a prototype out so that the customer can see it to make sure it's actually what they want. Then you can redefine it and actually make it pretty and right. all that other stuff. Yeah, Al Alan Cooper, I don't know if you know he is he's <coughs> a big name in, in UI um, usability. You know, he, he argues that teams should expect to write a prototype, throw it away, and then do it again <coughs> as part of the development process because you're not going to get it right the first time. You've got to get it out there, get the feedback, you know, experience using the technologies, you know, do that quickly and then do it right. 
because at that point it'll become very clear and you can be very focused and very efficient about doing it right. We had that happen in a real project, which is just reminding me. We had a real project where we had to th completely throw out something we had fully developed and delivered and rewrite it in a later iteration. It did occur. It took us, I don't know, a month and a half or something. But, it, you know, it, it was painful in the sense we had to start over, but it got us to the point where we really understood as the client what exactly we needed. Whereas if we'd have just sat there trying to design it, we could have been six months, you know, hacking around. But the reality is we needed to get something out there and the client needed to see it, and it really put us to reality. And then, then when we rewrote it, we were way more efficient. So yeah. it was valued. I haven't experienced that on our teams yet, in terms of you know, the rewriting bit. That's something we're trying to get better at. We're certainly not high up on the curve as far as the engineering practices, but it's something we're trying to get better at. Found that the best requirements always come after the client needs something. That's when you really find exactly. out what they yeah. So the quicker you've got it in front of the client, it's just approach would be well. Right. Probably better. Yeah. I, I should mention, it based on that comment, however, we don't use Scrum and Agile in front of clients. I just thought I'd mention it because it is possible to do that. We do. Mm -hmm. We don't. Like the type of our, our type of product is a large enterprise system and it's highly configurable. It's not really possible to go in front of clients unconfigured to show them features. It takes a whole layer beyond us, the business administrators, to set everything up to show clients. Mm -hmm. So we just use Scrum internally. Uh, our, our stakeholders are ourselves, they're our management, or the, or, you know, our upper management. So it, it's kind of a different flavor uh, to Scrum. I just thought to mention that, because you don't have to go great in front of clients if that's, like, it doesn't work for your business, as it doesn't really Sure. Well, in, in your case, your product owners are within the company, or yeah, the clients. Yeah, presenting to ourselves. Right. So I just thought to mention that, because, you know, if you're freaked out about talking to clients, but, you know, it doesn't work for everybody always. There's a, there's, a, there's a company called Patient Keeper that's sort of um, considered one of the models for doing Scrum in a, in a product way where basically they have, a, they have a product and they customize it for a lot of different clients. But internally, the team the teams just see one big backlog. They have no idea who the clients are. So they, they take all of these, the product owners come together, they prioritize all the stuff based on what all the clients want. They create the backlog, the team works on it, and then it gets distributed out to these various clients according to what they needed. So it's highly efficient because you're not you don't have the cost of starting up and pulling down a project every time. It's just a continuous stream. So I like to get to that and what we're doing. We're not quite there yet. Okay. Any final questions? It's been. Uh, Is there a sweet spot when it comes to numbers? Uh, people were talking about on a team. Is it oh right. Um, so the question is, how many people should be on a team? Um, it's generally accepted that um, seven no. Five plus or minus two, is that right? Um, or seven plus or minus two, sorry. It's sort of the, the sweet spot as far as the team size goes. Um, Actually, most of my teams are smaller than that. Along that line, how have you found this methodology work with staff turnover? So if you have staff leaving project, I don't know if you've had that experience yet on one of your scrum teams. Well, the question is about turnover. Well, again, that's the idea where if you don't have people doing silo stuff, if you're pair programming, if you're all working on a story together, there's a lot more shared knowledge within the team, so you don't have to worry so much about the Mack truck syndrome, one person leaving and having the knowledge of the architecture, right? So that will lessen that, that impact. I was so just thinking it's a little bit um, lighter on documentation than possibly mm -hmm. the, the rational approach, which also comes then with a lot of baggage and extra right. work, but um, well, on the other side, it's hard to hand something off to a new person. Sure, it's not that you don't do any documentation, but there's gotta be pretty good business value for it. When we write documentation, our client has to be convinced before we write it. So we wrote some stuff that we have to use internally to support the system, but he understands the value why. So we've got a bunch of documents that say, you know, here's one, a new developer comes on, how they have to set up their environment, step one through 10. You know, we had somebody who'd never been on the project to actually go through it to make sure it would work. Um, we have another, an overview of a, of a mapping system that's fairly complex. So we write documentation where there's value. Um, but not documentation for the sake of documenting everything that's in the system. So it's, it's strike, trying to strike that balance. And since you're forced to compartmentalize everything, if someone leaves, uh, unless they leave in the middle of an iteration, you're, they're taking over someone's task in the sense of the long task, but the iteration was complete, say. So they're, they're taking something that's actually working over taking code from someone that's partially written and you can't really figure out what it's supposed to do. You're taking over at least, a, even if it's 20%, that 20% is working, that's easier, I think. Than taking over code that's like not really doing anything anywhere, it kind of was like the under 
structure of a larger task. So you put that in the employment contract, and you, you, you notice instead of a random two weeks is the end of iteration. End of an iteration, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Can't read yet, sorry. Uh, any other questions for Jerry? This pro oh, go ahead. Uh, just one thing. Um, one thing I've noticed with uh, sometimes you end up with in, uh, in a project management, like a, a person will, will take up basically all the available time to 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 get an objective done. It's not something you should do, and, and it's not necessarily something people intend, even intend on doing. But unconsciously, they think, you know, I got two weeks to implement this feature. Mm -hmm. I'm and so they b budget their time, and it ends up taking the whole two weeks, even if that initial. Even if that initial, um, and maybe they're not going to actually work as hard as, as they would have if they if they had broken that up into smaller chunks. Mm -hmm. So, would you say that is a, like an advantage for the system that breaking up into chunks and you know, kind of meeting meeting each day and kind of seeing where everyone's progressing? Or sure, progressing. I give a few examples of that. Again, I work in a distributed environment, so I don't be a little more efficient. I don't see the people I work with. In one particular project, there was a guy in Brazil, a guy in France both kind of doing separate stories, not really working together, and our productivity was really low. No one really understood what people were doing. Sometimes they were stepping on each other's toes. It was an awful process. So just by bringing in and having these daily stand-ups, so we're checking in, right? We're coordinating. Um, those things get picked up pretty quick. Plus, you're a little more accountable when you're talking to your team about what you're doing, right? And if you're dragging the team down, um, that's gonna, that's gonna, you're, the, the team's gonna speak up. It's not a scrum master or a project manager cracking a whip, it's your, it's the team holding you accountable. Also, I would see it may actually introduce some, like, kind of good competition between the developers. Like, n not necessarily, like, bad, like, I don't know, a harsh competition or anything, but just kind of some friendly competition, because, like, you know, you get together and you want to be able to say, you know, I, I got this feature done mm -hmm. yesterday, or, you know, right. this is working improperly now. Right. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's, there's some of that for sure. Which would actually increase efficiency as well because when people are motivated to... to I think, uh, yeah, I think a lot of it is, is you're motivated because you don't want to let your team down or yeah. you, you want to be <coughs> you want to, you want to be part of the team that's going to deliver. And I've seen, I've seen that happen when switching from not doing Scrum to, to, to doing Scrum. Um, people are much more motivated and wanting to, to not let the team down, to, to be a contributor to the team. So it's all about the team in the end. It's not about your star coder who got all his stuff done. It's about did the right. team get it done or not. That's what matters in the end. And you, and you might think that board with the stickies looks like a hokey idea, because uh, I did when we first started. But it, it's amazing the sense of accomplishment you actually get just from seeing the stickies move from the left side to the right side. It seems like such a trivial thing, but right. in reality, it actually does work. We all felt like, oh my god, we get something done, because the pack of stickies is moving. You know, for us, uh, you know, beginning and middle end. And a little, a little less work than a Gantt chart. Yeah, <laughs> and a little less work than a Gantt chart. Yeah. One of the other nice things that you get is uh, during the daily meeting when you're sort of saying, I'm going to get this accomplished for tomorrow. If the next day, as you go around and say, well, no, I didn't. So, okay, but I'm going to get it done tomorrow. Next day, no, I didn't. All of a sudden, it brings up the point, either you underestimated the task and it's a lot more complex, so you're going to need more help, or you're having problems that you don't want to really share but all of a sudden you face up to it. Yeah. So the daily review really helps. And not, not that it's necessarily your issue. If it's something a lot more technically complex, all of a sudden the team can sort of say, you're right, let's jump in and help you. We underestimate it. And you correct it for the next iteration, next sprint. That's something I've observed before too, where somebody gets stuck on something and nobody else, it's not really anybody in particular self responsibility to help them or no, maybe nobody else really on the team is aware of the problem. Or Right, and and that kind of thing's going to get out when, when somebody's stuck on sure. something, and somebody's going to be able to. And that's the job of the scrum master too, to to, to 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 notice those things and, and make sure that they get raised and dealt with. Um, Just uh, one question before you go: If there's one book that you would recommend on this topic from a technical uh, perspective, would there be uh, one specific author? A, a technical perspective. Um, well. That sort of segues into my next slide here, which is basically, um, I've, <coughs> if you go to my blog now at that URL, or just jerrykirk.net, um, I have a posting on today's um, session. There's a whole s bunch of links there of useful stuff for people who are interested in Scrum. And I, I didn't post book recommendations, but I'll, I, I'll add that. Um, this is a few that yeah, I, I really value and use a lot. Um, and I'm hoping that uh, this 
video will work to synchronize with the slides, so I'll have that up for anyone who wants to see it again or somebody wasn't here or whatever. So. And Jerry, are we able to get a copy of this as well? Maybe put it on our website. We've done that with a lot of other tags as well. That's fine. I, again, I think without the talking, the slides are kind of useless. Because right? Right. It, there's not a lot of detail in it. But, uh, a couple of good charts. So. Right. <laughs> Excellent presentation. I, I don't think I've ever seen a more interactive crowd in one of our tags, so obviously I hit home with 